Yes, I'm a teacher and a researcher at the university, as you heard. And uh, I'm interested in online safety for children. And when I started out this uh, research, there wasn't very much written about this area. And the, the few things I could find were all from an adult perspective. And I was really interested in what the children themselves thought about online safety and the, the dark sides of the internet. Uh, so I didn't really know what to do. I wasn't funded in any way. Uh, so I turned to my four children and asked them how they thought about this. So they became my first informants. And uh, uh, three years ago, I fi uh, finally uh, published my PhD thesis. So you can look closely because I'm one of the few women who had an academic career, not in spite of the fact that she has many children, but even thanks to that fact. So, in your face, sexism. <laughs> so, online safety from a children's point of view. A lot of these issues concern so-called safe use guides. This isn't a very good microphone. <laughs> I hope you're not disturbed by the sound because I am. Um, safe use guides are lists where you compile tips and rules for how children should behave to keep safe online. I've looked through a lot of these safe use guides from a lot of countries and they're very simu similar. They might be copied from each other, or they might be copied from the first, same first source. I'm not sure. What I do know is that they're pretty old. In fact, I've traced them back in time, and uh, the oldest I've found where I can be sure of the date is from 1997. Let's think uh, for a few seconds about how internet use has changed since 1997. Quite a lot, wouldn't you say? Uh, the kind of uh, meeting places we know today that require a login procedure weren't there for, for the normal user, at least. Instead, we had these open chat rooms where you could choose your random nickname and go on chatting with people. And the thrill for most people was, in those days, being at the same website at the same time. Hmm, that's not really a thrill today. It's more like in the olden days when the telephone was new, probably people would, you know, call someone, just dial the five and send, hello, I hear you have a phone too. <laughs> Me too. Uh, today we require something else. We need something to, to bind us together. But the rules are the same. So how good can that be? One of the first rules that always appears is don't share. Don't share personal information on the internet. Don't tell people your real name. Don't give out your phone number. Don't tell them what city you live in. Don't tell them what school you go to. Don't publish a photo where you can actually see it's you. How does that apply to today's meeting places on the internet? Would you accept me as your friend on Facebook if I said, sorry, I can't tell you who I am. I'm, I have to be anonymous to protect my safety. <laughs> Trust me, I, I, I want to be your friend and you want to be my friend. You would probably decline. Well, you could do that for other reasons as well, but if we take this as an example. Rule number two is often remember that a lot of people on the internet are lying about their true identity. Well, duh, they've listened to rule number one, wouldn't you say? <laughs> but these are actual rules that are disseminated among children, parents, and teachers. 2010. There's also a fact that has emerged the last couple of years. We don't know for sure that there's a connection between giving out personal information and online risks. And uh, among the online risks that we are afraid of are harassment, 
and sexual predators seeking their victims online. So there's no simple connection between divulging your personal information and these risks. We do, however, know that the greatest danger you face if you're young today is having a troubled life away from keyboard. That's the most common, common denominator among the victims that uh, have been studied. And that's not really a problem we can solve with compiling lists. That's more of an adult responsibility to see to that every child has the same chance to feel good about themselves. Another thing we have to remember is that most sexual assaults against children are created or happening in a, an environment where the child should feel protected. Uh, and the abuser is most often someone the child should be able to trust. A parent, a step-parent, a football coach, a teacher, etc. That fact hasn't changed. The internet has not changed that fact. Another common way of trying to protect children is creating blacklists and whitelists of websites that are good or bad. This comes from a tradition of media studies where you try to find out how media uh, changes people, what happens when they consume media. But how about today's media when the content of the media is user-generated? How can we blacklist or whitelist these places? What happens if someone writes something uh, bad in a whitelisted website, what happens with that website and those tips? It is a good thing to think before you post, not only for young people, that goes for any of us. Because we have to think about the fact that what goes online stays online. As far as we know today, that's a fact. Most probably, the things we post online will stay there forever. So that could be a good tip. But what's more important, I think, is to think about how to react upon this fact. We have to have a relationship to eternity, and we're not very good at that. We often try to skip those questions if Children ask us, well, how, when does the universe end? We're not very keen on answering that question. But we have to have a relationship to eternity today. As I remember it, adults used to comfort young people. We used to say to teenagers, don't worry, not everyone is laughing at you. Oh, you will fall in love again. Your life isn't over. But as soon as the internet is involved, we're the ones panicking. Oh, but a future employer will Google you. Your life is over. And that doesn't make sense to me. What we not need now is adults who feel like experts. And most people who are adults are actually experts on problems that occur online. We need to be experienced from life. Well, everyone is. Uh, we need to have young people around us. We need to look them into the eyes and see how they feel and act upon that information. And also, we need to have a critical mind so that we don't swallow everything that is presented to us. As I see it, it's as simple and as complicated as that. Thanks for your attention.